Good evening. Um, I'm Avraham Popko. We are here in uh, Berlin at the tail end of the Kandinsky uh, conference, uh, which has graciously been willing to host this uh, interview. And as part of the Go To uh, Book Club, we are going to discuss today the book Domain Storytelling, a collaborative, visual, and agile way to build domain-driven software by Stefan Hoffer and Henning Schwentner. And we have Stefan and Henny over here, and we are going to discuss the book with them. Stefan and Henny, thank you for being with us this evening. Thank you to Kandinsky for allowing us to host this interview. Um, so I'm a storyteller, and I'm fascinated by how people use stories to, to create a worldview and to create a shared worldview. And I found your book to be really, really interesting, to be fascinating. And stories are one of the most useful tools that we have in order to create this shared uh, model of understanding. And um, Stefan and Henny, could you please tell us a bit about yourselves, what you do, how you met, and how you got into the area of uh, storytelling? Stefan. Sure. Yeah, I'm from Austria originally, where I studied software engineering, and I started out as a developer, then later on decided to do a PhD about modeling. And now my, my passion is to talk about requirements for business software and business process modeling. And I do that at a company called Workplace Solutions in Hamburg, which is where I met Henning. Yeah, and I'm Henning and um, I'm also a storyteller. I'm into books. I like stories, hearing stories, telling stories. That's one part of me and another part of me likes computers. And um, in domain storytelling, we kind of bring that together using storytelling to understand a domain and then bring it into computers. And also, I'm known in the DDD community as the guy with the many children. Well, rather than ask you to explain to me what domain storytelling is, Henning, could you show me what domain storytelling is? Yeah, awesome, that would be perfect. Then I would like to give a little demo. And if you like to meet my domain expert, then I'm going to interview you and hear a little story from you and then Model that. Let's go. It is, the year is 2021. The world is just coming out of a pandemic. Theaters are starting to open again. And uh, there are new requirements. And this particular theater, which I have been tasked to model software for, is only selling tickets online now. They still do not have in-person person purchase of tickets. And I would like to tell you the story of how a person goes ahead and buys a ticket or tickets to a, uh, a movie. So uh, she goes online to the theater's uh, website and she sees a list of what movies are playing and when and are there still available seats and what is the biggest group that can be accommodated in tonight's show, let's say. Okay, so that person looks at a list um, of the movies you say, um, uh, on the cinema website, and um, um, the name of that person or the role of that person, do we have a, a domain term for that? Uh, we're going to call her a customer. Okay, a customer. My and customer. And so the, she's looking at the list of movies at the cinema website. Right, and she finds out what movies are playing and mm -hmm. what's the biggest group that can be accommodated uh, for each hour. Okay. Um, finds out um, the biggest group. Um, Hour, uh, finds out the biggest group that can be accommodated um, at each hour. Okay. Um, and she reserves the block mm -hmm. for that uh, for that group. And uh, she starts buying a ticket, and she goes through the pay uh, procedure. Okay. 
show. So she uh, reserves a block and I assume this is all happening um, on the cinema website. Um, uh, and then uh, you say she buys the tickets, um, probably for the block, right? She buys the ticket for the block. And you say then she has to pay? She goes through the payment procedure, which is a procedure that already existed pre-pandemic. It's something that okay. already we know how to do. Okay, so she is um, paying the tickets and um, I assume um, she pays a price or something like that for a ticket? Yep. Is, is there? She pays the price per ticket, that's correct. And there is a credit card based interface that mm -hmm. is already supported mm -hmm. uh, pre-pandemic. Uh, okay, so here, I, I think the credit card interface is another IT system, right? Right. Credit card interface. So she pays the price for the tickets um, in the credit card interface. Okay. So, um, is, um, is that it, um, the story, or are we missing some steps here? Um, that is the end of this story. There's another story of canceling mm -hmm. a ticket, and there is a story of the theater uh, ad admin entering a new movie. Mm -hmm. um, but those are, okay. I guess those are other stories, is that correct? Okay, so I, I assume then this is the, the happy path where, where the movie is not cancelled. Right. right. Okay. There's, yes, and there will be other alternate stories like what happens if the customer wants to cancel the ticket and she's within the time allowed by policy. And okay. there is the story of what happens when the theater has to cancel the, mm -hmm. the, the showing because there was another outbreak. Okay. Um, I. I write that down, that there are alternatives. Um, cancellation... Um, by customer. By customer. Um, and also uh, cancellation by... Uh, theater. Theater. And I write that down here. Okay. Henning, what software are you using? So um, the software that we are looking at here, it's called Egan IO. Um, I'm going to open up a new tab here, Egan.io. Um, it's an open source software that was built in the company that Stefan and I are working for, WPS. And it's, as you can see, browser-based, and the idea is that it's um, an easy and lightweight tool to you, be used for domain stories. But it's not the only tool. Um, we are using it now because we're doing um, an online video and we want to use something that can be used in computers. We also could have done it on a piece of paper or on a whiteboard um, with sticky notes. Um, so we don't have to be digital. It can be uh, done in an analog setting just as well. Thank you, Henning. I now understand what domain storytelling is. And I think that writing a book about domain storytelling can be quite a unique challenge because the way I experienced it was as I was talking, you were, as I was telling you the story, you were doing a domain storytelling. And how do you capture that in book format? A book form is a static text. So could you tell us some of the challenges about writing the book and about uh, bringing that dynamics of storytelling and capturing a story to uh, text form? Yeah, yeah, that's actually a very good question. Um, when we started writing the book, we were both used to doing de do demoing like we, we did, um, like we just did. So showing people how it is by doing it. Um, also uh, showing it in talks um, where you have slides and they are dynamic. And that was um, quite of a challenge if we, wh when we were taking that and putting that into the book form. That's why we chose in the opening chapter to kind of 
uh, do a replay, and that's why we wrote a little story with some dialogue um, where people are interviewing each other, and then we have pictures where step by step a story grows. And what we did use um, was um, grayscale, so we said, well, uh, we let the story evolve with um, the parts that are new, they will always be black, and the parts that are old that have just been seen in the other pictures before, that they turn into gray. So maybe it reads a little bit like a comic book. So you see the story evolve like you would in, in a real domain storytelling workshop. Um, as human beings, we are very, very good storytellers. Very good storytellers. That's a big part of how we communicate, is tell stories. Whenever we hang around and gossip and share experiences and do tell a joke or advertise or whatever, we are essentially telling a story. And telling a story has the advantage that it captures an emotion, it captures an experience, it captures a drama. It's not just about a sequence of uh, events. Many of us are able to remember the stories that we have heard as adults or as child, how they made us feel, were they, did they make us laugh, did they make us cry? And um, part of the unique parents that we have, let's say with, with our parents or our children, are when we tell and hear stories. In any sense, does domain storytelling capture some of that uh, experience, capture some of that drama, capture some of that uh, togetherness that a real story tell might, uh, might capture? These emotions, um, they are part of the workshop experience. You don't necessarily, necessarily see them in the finished model, but it's part of the process of getting there. Domain storytelling is not just an oral activity, it's also a modeling activity. And models have a purpose. They are determined by the purpose. So the purpose of a story often is to, to entertain. So that's why if I write a novel and um, I, would, I would describe my characters in detail, I would add like, uh, how do you look, how do you behave, and, and all of that. So that's fine if I want to entertain. The purpose of models in the sense of domain storytelling is usually to develop software that um, enables that business process that we um, just uh, saw, for example, for the, for the movie theater that you described so well. So I don't necessarily need those details like how does this woman look like uh, that, that, uh, that bought the tickets? Uh, what did she have for, la for lunch before she bought the tickets? This is not a necessary detail for developing the software. But what I want to know is like, what kind of movie, how old is she? So um, those are the relevant details. And it's a, a skill, I think, that a moderator needs to have, finding out how much detail goes in the story. So what are the things that are uh, meaningful for the purpose, that serve the purpose, and uh, which I can um, leave out. And we're using this storytelling thing, because as you said, that's something that's deeply rooted in human beings. Already children can listen to stories. Um, they hear stories from their parents, from their grandparents sitting on their lap. And we want to have a means of communication um, that all human beings can use because we want to have communication and a conversation between technical people, developers, that's us, but also people from non-technical people, users, or future users of the software system, that do not have a formal education. So that's why we're not using a formal notation like UML or BPMN. That's why domain storytelling has its own very simple, very basic pictographic language. There is a part of the book, even though you said that we don't do it for the dramatic purpose, we do it for the, um, for the informative uh, or the communicative value and not for the experiential or dramatic value of the story. There, you do have, obviously, a flair for, for drama. And there's a part of the book from, uh, from the opening chapter uh, that does have some, some drama to it. And it, it stuck with me because I could identify with the story. I'm reading your first domain story. Matthew runs a small movie theater for art house films called Metropolis that enjoys an excellent reputation among cineasters. Who are these? People that go to the cinemas. Local craft beer and organic snacks round off the cinema experience. One day, Matthew meets his school friend, Anna. When he learns that Anna has been developing apps for almost 10 years, he gets an idea. 
And then you describe how Matthew and Anna tell each other a story and how they collaborate around a story. And um, I like, first of all, a cinema and an art house cinema is, brings up images of, 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 of culture, of youth, of people wanting to go and experience uh, something together. And uh, cinema always has a real value. They bring entertainment or they bring drama to our, uh, to our lives. And you tell the story, you tell it very, very well. It's almost a story about stories. And then Anna and Matthew start telling, uh, telling stories. And um, it's, it, it draws me in. And it might be worthwhile honing that skill of storytelling, of real dramatic storytelling as part of your domain storytelling so that we remember these things better, that we experience them better, they're more etched in our, uh, in our being. Do you, does that resonate with you? Is that something you could relate to? Uh, yes, absolutely. So especially in complicated cases, we often ask people to tell real stories from the past that actually happened to them which we then capture in the, in the visual model. So we've had stories about um, freighters stranded on a, on a sandbank in a river when we were modeling a, a disaster response team, the processes of a disaster response team in a harbor. Um, so these are the, the things that really highlight complicated relationships, a series of events that, that happens, activities that were necessary so these are the concrete examples that we learn from and um, that we um, put in our model. In some other cases um, where we don't have that, that drama, like let's say the movie theater, I don't necessarily need to know um, the, the backstory of the movie goer. Um, I'm fine with uh, she wants to buy um, two tickets next to each other Maybe I need to know how old the, the, the movie goers are because maybe it's a, a movie rated uh, 16 or older. Uh, we're recording this on Halloween, so maybe it's a, a scary movie. Um, so these are the, the decisions we need to make as modelers. Um, how much of the real world are we putting in the model? So, so there are two questions that come to mind. Um, you, you write in the book that the main story you want to capture is what you might call the happy flow or the main condition. When we tell stories, they are rarely about the happy flow. Stories that we like to tell are always about the exception, about something exciting or something different or something dramatic that happened. It's hard to tell stories about a happy flow. You know, the person got up, had breakfast, went to work, got home and went to bed. That, that's not an interesting story. Stories that we tell are always about the, uh, the exception. And um, that difference is, is, interesting, is interesting to me. So on the one hand, you take inspiration from storytelling, and storytelling is how we capture experience and how we remember sequences of events and how we uh, remember dependencies between uh, people and their actions and other people. And yet, one important part of storytelling is the exception. We don't often tell stories about the, um, about the, main, the main flow, because that's not the interesting part. Uh, do you find that there's a particular challenge there when, when at the workshops, let's say, when soliciting the stories and you're saying, don't tell me the story about the exception, tell me the story about the main, the main flow, the, un, the undramatic flow, just the normal, part of life. Is that a challenge that you face and how do you address that? So business software must of course not just support the, the exceptions uh, and the, the, the dramatic uh, variations of our process but also the, the happy path or the 80% case. So typically these are the cases that are easier to understand and to tell you a lot about why are we actually modeling this process or what is the goal of this process. And what we do is um, as you said, people, they often come with, with all the stories. Ah, one time this happened to me and one time that happened to me. And they want to tell you their, 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 their exceptions and the special cases that they had. And we need to take a look at those when we want to develop software. But it's probably not the first thing that we want to learn um, about. So 
what we do is we always we agree on the storyline. Let's say the, the typical case, so in the movie theater case, um, it's probably unrealistic that someone buys a ticket just for them alone. Yes, it does happen, but if I ask a, a, a cinema manager, they probably tell me that 70% of my moviegoers, they buy two tickets. So, okay, let's start with a, with a person buying two tickets for the movies. What happens next? So, we always try to get back to the main story, and if people interrupt the story by, ah, and I, they have this another story that I want to tell, say, okay, we'll make a note of this, and we'll collect all those interesting things that could happen or that happened in the past, we collect them on the side, and once we've finished our main story, we say, okay, now let's look at these variations. Which one uh, we should have a look at? Which one will, will um, help us learn more about the domain? So is it the story about, uh, one time this person didn't buy two tickets, about three tickets? Probably not, the process will be the same. But uh, the school teacher, he wanted to buy 100 tickets um, when come with, the, with, the, with three school classes and watch the, the movie. Now, that's interesting. And that's the story that we model next. Yeah. Also, I think um, there's an important point here. Um, I agree with you that for adults, um, the stories with the exceptions are often the most interesting. But in the situation that we're using domain storytelling, we're not usually not in the role of adults who already know what um, the main flow, the happy path is. But we're like children coming new into the world and we want to know what is happening. And when you look at books for small children, then we have these stories. <laughs> A man gets up, eats breakfast, goes to kindergarten and then comes back. And we are in a way in this mode because we first have to know what is, what is normal to then see what are exceptions. So the exceptions to what normal are these. So that's why we, we have this challenge that you're asking for, um, especially with technical people because programmers, of course, we like to think about all the exceptions, but we first have to know what are we doing this thing for? And then we can see, okay, what, when things go wrong, um, what things can go wrong. Thank you, Henning. That was, that, was very, very, that was very interesting. As I was reading the book, uh, a thought that kept on recurring to me is, how is domain storytelling similar to storytelling, and how is it, and how is it different? And one of the uh, issues that came to mind again was the, are we talking about the, the happy flow or the unhappy flow? And uh, I think you expressed that well, that when we share experiences with our children, and a lot of storytelling does happen between parents and children, um, then we often do discuss the happy flow. And thank you for expressing it that way. One of the things that you say in the book is that domain storytelling does not have any conditionals. There are always one path. And that's the way real stories are. Whenever we tell a, a story about something that happened, we're telling a story about something that happened. And things and history never has conditional. History could have been one way or the other, but it was only one way. And since stories are about what did happen and not what could have happened or what should have happened, they lack conditionals. And that does allow particular focus. And that helped me understand the fact that there are no conditionals, the difference between requirements and domain storytelling. And the way I understood it from the book, and you explain it is, requirements are what the system should do if properly implemented. And requirements are very future thinking. And uh, they're, they're very prescriptive. And the domain storytelling says, let's imagine that the system already exists. And let's tell a story about somebody that did something. And all the stories are written either in the past set, uh, tense or in the present tense. But they're not written in the future tense, as opposed to requirements which are often written in, a, uh, in the future tense. And do you find that when you conduct your workshops on domain storytelling, that that shift between what the system should do to what the system does or even what the system did, is that hard for experienced modelers to understand? Is that a thing that it's hard for people to grasp or they get it, they get it quite intuitively. They understand why you're shifting from the future tense to the present and even to the past. I'd say we kind of ease people into that. So the way we ask the question is usually, 
how do you imagine to change this process in the future or how do you imagine you will use the system uh, in the future? Um, often we start with the current process. So we, we analyze, we learn from the as is, from the, um, how things are today. And then we talk about like, okay, so imagine now instead of this, this old bad software and of this new uh, ticketing system. So how do you imagine it works? And they automatically tell, tell us, start to tell us the, the story of um, how it will be. So they, they can imagine um, working with this new system. So it, to me, it feels quite natural, um, uh, this, this way of um, discovering requirements by pretending you already have the system and, and play this out. Also, um, usually before we're pretending we're having a system, we start with, how is the process today? So let's look at the paper process, no IT um, involved, and understand what are people doing. And then we're moving on to this, okay, let's now pretend there is a system. How will the process then change? And how is the, uh, how is the story then when the, the IT system is there? And as you mentioned, I think that's important. In both cases, we tell the story in, in the present. So we're doing, going step by step through it in the as is and also in the to be although the to be, of course, plays in the future. And you find in your workshops that that works, that people that maybe struggle with requirements the system should do, once that we, we transpose them into the system does, and you give personas also, you often give names or you give roles, uh, do you find that people find it easier to express themselves in story form than they do in requirement? I think it's not an either or. Um, for me, uh, let's see if you agree. For, for me, it's typical that you start with domain stories to understand what's uh, happening in a domain and what you want uh, the, the, the system to be in the future, and then from that come from uh, come to requirements. So it's it's a typical thing that we start with coarse grain or medium grain domain stories, and from that derive user stories. Beware, domain story, user story, both kinds of story, but a user story is a requirement, a written requirement, um, a domain story is a diagram in, in, in that sense. And we can come from this um, domain story to a user story or to a couple of user stories. So um, looking at a bigger picture, domain storytelling is one method of this collaborative modeling method family, and another method is user story mapping. And if we have a uh, user story, a domain story at the, of the right granulation, then we can start with that as a backbone for a user story map and then derive user stories direct, directly from that. And typically in those user stories, we will be more detailed than we are in the domain stories. Who is the target of a domain story? So you go through the workshop, you write the story, you tell the story. There's value happening right there. Because as people are telling the story and creating the artifact, they're being forced to think about particular things. They're being forced to, yeah. yeah. So and then they're done. And then they go home, and they're left with a picture on the whiteboard or on the, uh, or on the computer. Who is the audience? Who's going to read that story and develop software to it? Yeah, M maybe no one. So um, I agree that the, the most important part happens in the workshop. So we want um, this campfire experience of the storytelling. Storytelling happens when people gather around a campfire, one tells a story, the others listen to that. But it can, in some cases, also help as a documentation to look at the picture afterwards. But the picture alone, well, is only a picture, and the spoken word um, also helps a lot. So typically, it is a good idea to not only take the diagram, but to retell the story after the workshop when you want to show somebody what has happened there and what was the knowledge gain that, that happened here. We're at the tail end of the Kandinsky conference. And uh, one of the things that I've been noticing more and more at the Domain Driven Design conferences and at other conferences is that we take inspiration from other fields of human, human experience. We take inspiration perhaps from the studies of language, from studies of complexity theory, from studies of communication. And your book about domain storytelling, which is about storytelling, fits neatly into that. 
storytelling has very, very ancient uh, human roots. We've been, we're a storytelling species from, from the very early, early days. And when looking at the journey of how storytelling has evolved over the years, initially storytelling was a, uh, an oral activity. We sat around the, uh, the fireplace, the, fi the, the, the campfire, sorry, we sat around the campfire, and one of us would tell a story about something he experienced or something he felt or something he did or something that happened, and we would all listen and remember the story, and then maybe a generation later, somebody who was young at the time of the campfire would tell the story on again, and these stories only lived in the memories of people. That's the way stories were, and some of these stories maybe lived for a thousand years, but only as an oral uh, verbal experience. And then we started writing the stories, uh, but we only wrote them down as an aid to, to our memories. We wrote them down, uh, let's say, Greek theater. So when stories like uh, Homer were written, they were written so that the actors could remember what to say, but the story was still told at the time of the play. Uh, now, we have already stories where you could go pick up a paperback and read the story and the author tells the story when he writes the paperback, but he tells it again when I read the paperback, and I'm experiencing the story just by reading the novel that was provided to me by an author with an imagination, and it's not telling anymore. And I feel when reading domain storytelling that there's some return back to our roots. We're getting back to the art of domain storytelling. We are telling a story, and creating visual artifacts as we are speaking, artifacts that, um, that capture the story in some way. Exactly, that's, that's exactly what we wanted to achieve with this technique. So the idea is really, really to bring together the people um, that, for example, if you develop software, well, please, in your, in your storytelling workshops, include the people who will actually develop the software, at least some of them. Um, tossing over an artifact is, is not enough. So let's imagine that um, the story that Henning modeled, that uh, you told him. If Henning is the business analyst and I'm the developer, I was not at a workshop, and he emails me the, the final diagram and uh, writes, well, here it is, here's the picture, it's all in there, just develop the software, develop the ticketing system. It won't work that way, because there's always more to the, to the picture than, than meets the eye. In my experience, when um, people retell the story, they always add information that is not in the picture, but they remember that from the workshop because they were there. If you missed that campfire experience, if you were not at the workshop, then the picture doesn't mean as much to you as um, if you were actually there. And, and, and um, if you really were immersed in this experience, then it's an aid to memory and, and you can transfer that to other people. We call it domain storytelling for a reason. We didn't call it domain story writing or domain story reading. So that's the, that's the idea, really bring people together and have those conversations. The conversation is more important than the model. Yeah. And I, I really like your metaphor, so domain stories are not novels. <laughs> They, they can be used as plays sometimes, yeah, but first of all, they're stories that are told. Uh, one of the things that I like about stories, um, stories are very often not limited by the possible. They open our imagination. In the stories that I read my children, we have animals that talk, we have people that stay young forever, we have people that know things that nobody told them, we have people that, they're poisoned apples and all kinds of, well, maybe that can't exist for real, but there are many other things that can't exist. But maybe not, not poison from witches, right? <laughs> right, right, exactly, <laughs> right. There are witches and fairies and ghosts and, and, and the stories allow that imaginary uh, universe and that's a wonderful thing and we could experience all kinds of uh, new, new things that are not bound by, uh, by reality. And that's why we love going to movies because life could sometimes get a little boring, but when you go to a movie and you see things that have, especially you know, the action movies or the fantasy movies, and uh, we love telling stories and we love listening to stories. And um, do you find that that ability to detach and not be limited by reality or not be limited by time, 
I could tell you a story about a lifetime of a man from the time he was an infant until the time he grew to an old wise man. I can tell it to you in 10 minutes. And, um, and it'll be a very compelling story about, a, about a, a growing up and discovering the world. And do you find that those abilities um, are able to be harnessed in the art of domain storytelling? Is that something, something you're able to bring through, that, that value of storytelling? Yeah, so the second thing, yes, um, we can tell very short domain stories. So we're talking about this thing that we call granularity. So we can take a long story and tell it only in three steps, in three sentences, or we can go to a more fine-grained um, level where we can take uh, and call and tell several steps. Um, and for the first thing, um, I think that's where the storytelling or the story metaphor comes to an end, because usually we do not want to hear what's not possible, because in the end, there has to be software to be built, and that has to be built in real life for what's really possible. So what we are always saying to our um, users, to our domain experts is, we want to hear real stories, we don't want to hear fairy tales, because um, we want to build in the end software that really helps um, our users. So um, maybe um, that's a different from real stories to domain stories <laughs> that we have here. Well, I you kind of disagree. I kind of disagree, not completely, but um, there are things that are easier to imagine in story form that are still rooted in reality and not complete fairy tales, um, but that help you to overcome certain challenges that um, people have become so used to, they, they cannot perceive a, a different reality. For example, um, if you're used to work strictly within the boundaries of your department, um, or if you are limited by, well, you have uh, some old piece of software that does not support your, your business process very well. And sometimes people then become so accustomed to this bad business process that they cannot imagine doing things differently. And putting this, this in story form helps them to break loose of these, of these chains that this bad piece of software has put on them for years, for decades maybe, and then they start to rediscover their domain and, ah, yeah, we could do things differently and, ah, let's do it like this and let's do it like that. So that really helps to break free from this, this constraints. So these are not fairy tales, but still, I think they are, um, they are, they are not real yet, but, um, yeah. yeah. What I think is that the main point is they are exploring um, the possible. And we, we always, we typically want to stay always or most of the time in the possible, not in the impossible, because, well, the impossible will be a model that doesn't help anybody in, in the real world in the end. Okay, uh, we're approaching the end of this very interesting interview, uh, and it's been very educational to me. Um, could, Stefan or Henning, could one of you tell me a story? A story about domain storytelling or about anything else? You recently told me an interesting story about uh, carbon footprints and reducing them. Do you yeah. want to share that? Yeah, yeah maybe, um, maybe I'd I like to share that. I, I had a client um, a couple of months ago, um, which was a, a newly founded company, um, founded in the pandemic, um, a, a, a worldwide organization. They hired people from everywhere, and uh, their goal is to help other companies reduce their carbon footprint. So they're kind of the good guys, um, saving the world. And um, I was invited to moderate um, a session where, for the first time, they all came together. Um, all the people from from the all the good people from from different kinds of the world. And uh, it was a great session because first um, they were they were very nice and very smart people that have great ideas. Um, on the other hand, they had a problem they had never met in real life, and also they they, they came from very they, they they do come from very different fields from science, but also from consulting, from IT, and what was missing was a common understanding, and um, I was invited to uh, to be a facilitator or a moderator in that situation, and we modeled some 
domain stories, starting coarse grain, then going into more detail to understand what is it that we're actually doing. So, and in a two-day workshop, um, we had a great, um, we, we, we gained, came to a great result because in the end, they had a common understanding of, okay, this is what we are doing and this is what we are. And that, that uh, yeah, that, that, that's the kind of experience I like to have with a method like that. So that was awesome. Thank you. That's a good story. Thank you. Thank you very much. Stefan, do you have a story you could tell us? So many good stories. So um, one recent experience, and this was rather new for me, is um, I was uh, invited by a company. They are kind of shifting the business model. I cannot go into the details here, of course, but um, it was one of the few times where uh, the storytellers were the top management. So members of the board shared their vision for this new business model that they had. And the listeners in this workshop, um, there were only a few storytellers, the board, and the listeners were software architects, department heads, um, so, so um, middle and, and top management people who needed to understand this new vision, this new business model that they were working on. And they, the, the listeners, they also asked questions like, ah, oh, how do you mean that? And how do you see that? And this was really interesting to see uh, this, this kind of high level uh, conversation leading to a better understanding of the future of this company and, and what they want to do in the future. So it was not really about software yet. Yes, of course, they will need to adapt all the software systems. And now actually I'm still working with them. And now we are breaking things down into, okay, what does it mean for this system? What will it mean for that system? Um, there are organizational changes. There will be, for legal reasons, they need to found uh, new companies that they, for example, one needs to get a bank license, all of that stuff. And it all started with this handful of, of coarse-grained um, domain stories giving this overview of how do, how do we want to work in the future, what do we want to enable. So this was really fascinating to, to see this happening. That's really interesting. And one of the observations that I have as you're telling me these stories is sometimes uh, there's a perception that stories are for, for leisure or for fun or for the spare time or for children. At the workplace, we're serious people. We don't, we don't tell stories. We, we do work. We have requirements. We have spreadsheets. We have charts. We have graphs. We have deadlines. We don't have time for that stories. Maybe on, when we're out golfing, we'll tell each other some stories. And stories is one of the most effective ways we know to communicate. It's maybe the most effective way we know to communicate and to share an experience or to share a vision or to share a, uh, a worldview. And what your book is, is describing is bringing that amazing ability as as human beings we are storytellers every culture that we know is is storytellers and people that are not comfortable writing requirements are probably good storytellers we're all storytellers and your book very artistically brings that ability to to tell stories to the workplace and let's harness that let's harness that ability that human ability of ours in order to our, our ability to tell and listen to a story to develop better uh, better software so, Stefan and Henning, uh, thank you. Thank you very, very much. Um, and thank you to uh, Kandidinsky, the Kandidinsky Conference for allowing us to uh, have this interview here. And uh, here, this is the book. The book is Domain Storytelling, a collaborative visual and agile way to build domain-driven software by Stefan Hoffer and Henning Schwentner. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, have a good evening. Thank you, Abraham, for your time. It's been a pleasure being interviewed by you. And uh, maybe I can share that. Um, we are especially happy because um, the very first sentence in, in our book is a quote by you, where you say that some things must be told that cannot be written, so that storytelling is deeply, deeply human. So thank you again um, for, for interviewing us and um, um, borrowing your time to us. Thank you. Thank you, Henning. Thank you. Subscribe to the GoTo YouTube channel now and join the experts in person or online at any upcoming GoTo conference using the promo code Book Club. Visit gotopia.tech to learn more. Thank you.